Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, Genesis chapter 22, verse 2. Then God said, Take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Abraham's son, his only son, uh, the son he doted on. Now, I'm no uh, child psychologist, and I have four kids, not one, but sometimes, and with four kids, sometimes things can get a little bit wild. You almost don't have enough tension for every child. But an only child typically receives a lot of attention and love from their parents, which is generally a gift, a blessing to the child. Um, now, at times, uh, I've been accused of being too protective or uh, oppressive. I mean, not oppressive. <laughs> Possessive. My kids may have said that, though. <laughs> at times, I've been accused of being too protective or possessive of my kids. But with four kids, no matter how protective you want to be, uh, you sometimes can't stop everything. You've got to pick your battles a little bit. On the other hand, if you've only got one, you can practically be as involved as you would like to be. And almost all parents are especially careful with their first child, um, which is why it's hard to imagine um, Abraham going to sacrifice his son, his only son, one that he had waited 100 years for. Abraham was perhaps the type of father who wouldn't even let Isaac play with the other rocks that the other kids were playing with because maybe they weren't organic enough. Or Abraham seemed to be a little more aware of what Isaac was doing than, say, Jacob with his 12 sons running all over. Abraham probably made Isaac ride the family uh, camel with the hospital approved four point harness, uh, even if it, was, if it was just a half mile jaunt down the road to pick up some fast food. It's hard to imagine any father, especially a father with an only son, what they must have been thinking at God's command to sacrifice his son. And maybe it doesn't bear writing down because we're not told. But you've got to imagine there were some questions and some consternation on Abraham's part and perhaps even some sleepless nights on that multi-day journey to Moriah. But to fast track this baby a little bit, all's well that ends well, as they say. Abraham goes to sacrifice Isaac, but like Tom Brady swooping in at the last second, Yahweh intervenes just in time to say, stop. Don't do it. God says, I don't want to take the boy's life. I don't even want to see him injured. I did want to test you whether you truly trusted me or not, and you've passed. You trusted me to do what was right, even when what I said seemed obviously wrong. You relied on my promise to make you the father of many nations, even when I was asking you to kill the son, your only son, and your only hope to see that accomplished. Well, now uh, the blessing is mute. Now the trust is mutual. You trusted me, and I trust you enough to do great things uh, for you. Um, now, I swear on myself, on God, we might say, because of this, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. I will bless your descendants, but not only your descendants. In fact, through your descendants, all the nations that walk the face of the earth will be blessed, and your name will be remembered, and it will be synonymous with faith. And that's what it's all about for Yahweh. It's all about trust. But as anyone, any of you who have a good friend or a good, or a, a sp a good spouse or a family life can tell you, trust is best when it's a two-way street. It's good to be as faithful and as loyal as you can, even when others aren't. However, uh, a truly beautiful relationship is one where there is mutual trust 
and respect. And that's exactly what God wants for you and me. Mutual love and trust and respect between us. Uh, Loyalty and trust are really synonyms for faith, and that's why the scriptures extol faith. You know, faith is not a mindless trust in just whatever some higher up says. That's a terrible working definition for faith, at least according to the scriptures. But that's what people sometimes mean when they say the word faith. No, faith means, in the scriptural sense, developing a relationship with our Lord and learning that what he says rings true in life, that he gives worthwhile advice, and then when it all goes south, you can expect God to be there with you in the thick of it. Anyway, that's why I trust my Lord and Savior, because he's certainly been there for me at all times, including when I've had tougher times. He's not abandoned or betrayed me, even though the trust and um, has not always been as mutual as it should have been. Uh, Plus, the more and more I experience and observe the world around me, the more fundamental and true the the things that Jesus said really seem to me. At the beginning of this story, um, uh, Abraham learned that the Lord sometimes requires sacrifice. Uh, But by the end of the story, it was reinforced to Abraham that he could trust Yahweh with, well, anything. The beginning of this story teaches us, likewise, that sometimes we have to make sacrifices to follow our Lord. Life itself sometimes requires sacrifice, and sometimes God may, nay, probably will, ask us to sacrifice something that we cherish. Yet, sacrifice is not really about what God needs. Uh, This becomes more and more clear as the Old Testament unfolds. Uh, The Psalms uh, talk a lot about it. Um, The uh, Psalm 50 asks, Yahweh asks sort of hypothetically, do I eat the meat of bulls? Do I drink the blood of goats? Rather, make thankfulness your sacrifice to God and keep the vows you made to the Most High. Uh, Psalm 51 says, you do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. Rather, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. God, you will not despise. You see, God wants us to be connected to him. And repentance and faith are the way that he can connect to us. That's the way that connection can happen. Uh, The prophets, likewise, uh, are replete with qualifications of what is and what is not the point of sacrifice. Uh, In Hosea, Yahweh says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. In Jeremiah chapter 7, Yahweh explains, when I brought my people up out of Egypt, the most important thing I told them was not to sacrifice to me, but rather simply to obey me. I don't want you to feed me. I want you to listen to me. It's all summed up rather nicely in Micah chapter 6, uh, verse 8. He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? The sacrifices were there for a purpose. They were a way to connect to and be reconciled to God. The sacrifice didn't, they certainly didn't sustain God or really make him happy. Burning grain or pouring out wine, that doesn't give God anything that he didn't have already in the first place. However, this voluntary act demonstrated loyalty and faith. The sacrifices reinforced to the Israelites that they depended upon Yahweh. When the people sinned, the sacrifices offered a way that God had given to them to be reconciled to him. 
Nevertheless, the real way in which the world would be reconciled to their creator would actually be accomplished by God's sacrifice, right? Not by the people's sacrifice. It's not just that we need God to be reconciled to us to survive, although we do. It's also that God wants to be reconciled to us. He wants our relationship between him and us to be repaired even more than we need it to be repaired. Uh, God longs to be reconciled uh, to his people. And, and he was willing, we know as we think about sacrifice, can't help but think about God sacrificing his only begotten son for you for, and for my salvation. And again, not because, this is maybe sometimes misunderstood, not because Jesus being killed made things right in and of itself. God could very well, right? I mean, think of if someone killed one of uh, your loved ones. God could very well have been righteously angry at the treatment of his son, and no one would have been able to blame him for it. He could have wreaked a terrible vengeance upon this world for killing his innocent son. But... The Father chose not to. God the Father was not obligated to forget or forgive because of the cross. It's really the exact opposite. People, I think this is sometimes misunderstood by Christians. God had to have, Jesus had to offer his blood. Um, But that's not really what it's about. God chose to allow and accept Jesus' unfair death as a sacrifice. It didn't have to be that. It only became that because Jesus offered it up as such, and God the Father approved it as such. A sacrifice that Jesus made to show the world that he was not looking to be at war or seeking to attack us. Because if he wanted any sort of excuse, he would have had it in Jesus' innocent death. But this sacrifice shows rather that God does not want war, even when we want it with him. God desires peace with you and me. And Jesus was so committed to offering mercy and forgiveness to us that he would do so even when a torturous death was the only way he could get through to us. And because of that, we are forgiven because our God loves us so much that he would be willing to sacrifice his only son if that's the only way he could be reconciled to us. The sacrifice God wanted was not something that we could give, it turns out, but something that only he could give in his son. And he willingly did so for you and me. In Jesus' name, amen.